As we mentioned at the beginning, uh, Mr. Khan has graciously agreed to do a Q&A. And thanks to all of you and Twitter, we have a number of suggested questions. So I've gone through and I've picked out some of the favorites. And uh, I'm going to pull them up here. Thank you all for participating. It was great to see the stream as it went through. Um, by the way, I'm really thrilled with the joint announcement. Thank you for choosing this venue to make that exciting announcement. I just hit publish. It's on the web now. So one of the early questions that came in, uh, and I think it's one that's on a lot of people's mind, and I think it's one you've addressed before, but it would be great to share here is, what do you say to teachers who are fearful that they will be replaced? Yeah, I, and you know, I think there's a, there's a natural reaction whenever people hear about anything in technology, maybe it's going to compete with the physical, Amazon.com versus Barnes and Nobles. But I think, and, and, you know, I, and I think there are people in the technology world who do think in those types of terms. But everything that we talk about, and, and I think this is absolutely, but even the same people who talk about that for their own children, they wouldn't want that. They want someone in the room. They want an incredible experience uh, with, with a human being. And so for me, and this is everything we talk about and I write about and I speak about, is in my, the te technology is, is only going to elevate the role of the human being here. That, that, that role of setting the culture, of diagnosing where a student is, of leveraging data, leveraging technology, meeting every student where they are, that's harder than, 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 than giving a lecture. Uh, you know, as someone who's made 4,000 videos, I'll say that I think the, the lecture part is the least important part. It really is about that setting the culture and guiding and, and, and mentoring the students. So when I imagine what I want for my own children, it is a very physical experience where they go, sure, hopefully they use tools like Khan Academy to learn some of their core skills, but they have amazing teachers, amazing peers around them, and they're spending their days in doing true inquiry, true, true exploration. Excellent. Well, absolutely. And that hits on a couple of the other questions that I had favorited. One actually said, um, don't you feel that your videos are, are bringing an outdated lecture style lesson format from the classroom to the home? And you sort of just, just addressed that. Is there any thought to, to add to that? Yeah, no, and, 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 uh, you know, and this is somewhat ironic. Is, you know, and what I'll say is that there's a guy who's made you know, 3,000 or 4,000 videos, and we, we obviously host a lot on Khan Academy. I view those videos as the least important part of, of the education process. And their, their, their utility is that they took it out of the classroom so that the classroom can focus on, in my mind, higher yield activities. Now, I don't think that there, you know, there, there is some value where you know, in the middle of the night, you, you, you need a refresher on, on how to take a derivative, or you don't quite understand why borrowing works, and there's a video there to explain that to you. So I think it adds value, but once again, it's taking it out of the central portion and allows the, the, focal, of the focal point of the classroom to be the more hands-on. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, I forgot to mention the names of the folks asking the question. That was uh, Alex Bega, who asked the first question at Alex Bega on Twitter. And then the second question was Arthur Preston. So thank both of you. Uh, Peter Abood from New Tech High has this question. And it's something we spoke at just before the keynote, you and I. Um, Love that Khan Academy provides data and leads to deeper learning. How can Khan Academy be used in PBL, project-based learning, and other inquiry learning? Yeah, well, you know, this is something that's very close to my heart. And you know, Khan Academy itself started, I mean, obviously, that first summer camp that I was talking about, that's all we were doing. And then Khan Academy's run some summer camps since then to really explore with, uh, how we can empower project-based learning. And in my book, I write about how if I imagine the school of the future, you spend some relatively small fraction of your day on core skills using, say, tools like Khan Academy to make sure that kids are on track to meet whatever standards are there. But then the rest of the day, and I'm talking about 80% of the day, is on inquiry-based, project-based learning, where students do have, and, and multidisciplinary, where they have the time and the space to, to experiment, do open-ended things, and, and, and fail, try things and fail. Um, and so, you know, what, for my own, my son is uh, just turned five years old, and so when I'm thinking about what my dream for him in kindergarten, first grade, second grade is, core skills through tools like Khan Academy, but then the deeper skills happen through simulations and projects. Excellent, great. Uh, Brian Bennett asks, how does your system judge mastery? And he mentions multiple choice questions, and, and perhaps that's, that's not the best way to judge mastery, but do you have an answer on that, a thought on that? 
Yeah, so, so uh, I guess there's two things. So the, the item design itself, and this is actually something where we worked very closely with the folks at Smarter Balance. We've worked with other uh, experts on it. So a lot of the common core exercises that you're going to see, because the common core is about going beyond multiple choice. So you're going to see a lot of free answer. You're going to see a lot of free expression entry. This is actually some state-of-the-art tools so that a student can enter in a free equation, and it will check the various forms that, you know, historically multiple choice exists because it's hard to grade all the different forms of a free expression just that someone could enter. Say, but, the answer is always C, right? Exactly. That's what I was told. <laughs> exactly. So I, I think if, if you all explore, you're going to see there's a lot of much more manipulatives. You know, in our geometry, students have to construct things. A lot of the Common Core, there's the construction standards. So we have tools so the students have to literally construct points. They have to transform things. So as much as we can in this form factor, we're trying to make it uh, a, a manipulative. And then in terms of how we assess mastery, we're building a, essentially a machine learning model where we're, because we have five million exercises done every day, we can see, well, a, a student who has done performed in this way, what's the probability that they're going to be able to do another problem similar to that problem? And so we're using that to gauge how, how far along that mastery curve a student is. And we also know that it decays. So as we see that a student's probabil probability has decayed, we can let them review it in kind of a, a context switching mode. Excellent, great. I, I don't know if you're a fan of science fiction, but I was always uh, intrigued by uh, Orson Scott Card's vision of personalized learning in Ender's Game, where every student was given a, he called it so a So every desk. person we hire or recruit at Khan Academy, we make them read Ender's Game. You do? Yes. Okay, I swear I didn't know that. That was yes. not a plan. Okay, we're just and, about in time. And actually the Foundation Trilogy, but that's just because I like, but, but that has relations, anyway. So I shouldn't tell you that he declined the keynote spot and then, oh, okay, yeah. I should, anyway. Um, he wasn't available in any case. Um, but the last question, and I, I loved this question, and it came across is, can you tell us how your cousin is doing now? How is Nadia doing now? Yes, well, no, I've talked to her recently. Um, I told her there's a lot riding on your future. Uh, there's <laughs> no pressure. She's a, she's a senior at Sarah Lawrence. Uh, she's actually a, an incredible writer, and I, I can't claim that I had any, anything, anything to do there. And it's actually funny, I spoke at a conference, and you know, well, this is it's a little bit of a stereotype, but I guess it has a seed in truth, where it was actually a, a South Asian conference, and, and they, they asked this question, and I said, oh, well, she's a writing major at Sarah Lawrence, I'm very proud, and I got all this mumbling in the audience. And then I said, but she's also pre-med. And it was like, oh, very good, very good. She's, so she's also pre-med. What a horrible cousin. You've placed these pressures on her. Yes, My goodness. Tiger cousin, what can I say? Yes. Well, thank you. We really yeah. appreciate you coming out. Thank you. Thank you so much for making it possible. Thank you. That's here for Saul Khan, ladies and gentlemen.